Dear Mom, I don't remember when we started doing puzzles together. It's kind of like we always have. I've thought a lot about the puzzle piece you gave to me before I came here. I didn't understand it. I didn't even want it. Mrs. Rogan, she's one of my house parents. She's a really nice mom. She I told her I was afraid to see you again. I cried when I heard myself say it because I love you, but I've just been so angry and sorry and well, she thought I should write you this letter first. Before, I was so scared and confused. Everything around me felt overwhelming and then you sent me away. Why would you send me here to live with strangers in this place? Was I too much? So I cried and cried and prayed angry prayers and asked angry questions and I hated Mr. and Mrs. Rogan when they would try to help me. One night, Mrs. Rogan wanted to do a puzzle with all the girls in the house and I threw it against a wall. She cleaned up my mess and she just sat with me. It's like she was waiting on me. After a while, I wasn't so angry, but I am sorry. Sorry for the things I said and the things I thought. And when Mrs. Rogan and I prayed at night, it started to be different. I still ask questions sometimes, but mostly I say thank you for Mr. and Mrs. Rogan, for all the friends I've made here. I thank God for the village and for our puzzles. You knew what I needed, and you knew you couldn't be that right now. And that's okay. I am so proud to be your daughter. So before I come home, I'm writing to say thank you. Love, Mary Ann. behalf of the family of faith here at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, I want to welcome you to our morning worship hour. And if you are a guest, we're certainly glad that you have taken time out of your schedule to be with us, and we want to be good stewards of your time. However, we would like to know a little bit about you, and we'd like to know how we can come alongside you and minister to you in this uncertain times that we are living in. Uh, when you came in, you should have received an order of worship from one of our greeters. If you'll open up that order of worship, there's a visitor's card. It also says prayer request. We'd like to pray for you, but we'd like to have some information about you and your family. If you'll write that down, and we'll be in contact with you. If you're watching by way of Facebook or YouTube, we want to welcome you into our worship service. Had an unusual thing said to me yesterday. An individual has been watching our broadcast now for almost a year, and she lives in North Carolina, and she said, if I thought it was feasible, I would drive nine hours one way to come and worship with you all. 
I thought that was a pretty high compliment. So if you're watching by way of Facebook or YouTube, we want to welcome you into our service and extend you a personal invitation to come and visit us here at 1383 Pleasant Hill Road. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Say that with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you today for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we're so thankful that we have an opportunity to worship you now in spirit and truth. We pray that our worship indeed would be worthy in your sight. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand together as we sing. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found. Yesterday we had a service here at the church, and uh, prior to that service, I had an old friend of mine who, who lives in Columbus now, who was here, and uh, he came up to me and said, uh, I want to give this to you. And I said, okay. I said, what is it? He said, well, you'll have to open it up. And it just says, Brother Bill wanted to share a keepsake we found. So I looked at that envelope, and I was almost afraid to open it. And, and, and as soon as I opened it, and I got it to right here, I mean, that's all I needed to see. 
and I knew what it was. It was a letter to them from my dad that he wrote back in 1979. And in that letter, he is thanking them for being such good friends to him and neighbors. And he said, you know, it was a privilege to serve as their pastor. And I just thought, you know, that's his handwriting. And I, as I read this for the first time, I really got emotional because, you know, my dad passed away many, many years ago. But to see his handwriting and to almost hear his voice as he was saying those words rather than writing them, that was just kind of bringing a flood of emotion back to me. Have you ever had, have you ever had a letter written to you? A letter or a card? You, you've all gotten cards because I've sent you cards. I know that. You've gotten a birthday card for me and it had something written in it. But there is a letter that is written to you by God. Did you know that? There is a letter that is written to you by God. It's called the Bible. And this is God's love letter to all of us. In this book, he tells us time and time again how much he loves us. In that letter, my dad said he considered it an honor to be their friends, but also to serve as their pastor. And God is saying in his letter, when you hurt, you need to understand, I love you. When you're happy, I love you. When you're sad, I love you. And you can never walk too far from God. So, if God sends us a love letter, what should we do with it? Well, if I hadn't have read this yesterday, it wouldn't have blessed me. I can't be blessed if I'm not reading God's word to you. His letter. Remember that. This book is for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for loving all of us as your children. And I pray right now that you would bless these children and give them a hunger for your word. And Father, even those who, who cannot read, they can have stories read to them. Love letters from you, written in red. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
continue to worship. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us. For our use, thy souls prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us.
and encourage you this morning to open up your Bibles to the book of Hosea, the third chapter, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Now, I want to remind you about our schedule next week. How many of you love coming to the 830 service? I mean, you really do. Okay, well, you're out of, you're out of luck next week. We'll only have one worship service next week because it's Memorial Day weekend. A lot of people are going to be jetting off and it'll be a long uh, extended weekend for you. So we will only have one worship service at 11 o'clock. And we will have more ropes that will be coming down from these two sections here as we strive to get back to kind of the normalcy, really, of doing church. The other side of that is... In the next few weeks, we will be relying on a lot of feedback from you as our church family as we go forward uh, of, of a schedule and what that schedule is going to look like. And we've tried to explain this to you on Wednesday night, but I know not everybody watches Wednesday night. But we're trying to see how we're going to be doing church in the fall. And we need your help. We need your input because it is vital and I hope that you'll be praying about that because we want to be right there, smack dab in the center of what God wants for this church. So you're going to get your chance to give us some feedback, and we'll do the very best we can to be good stewards of it. Let's honor the reading of God's Word today as we talk about forsaking our first love. Hear with me now the Word of our Lord. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they have turned to other gods and loved the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 13 shekels of silver and about an omer and a letha of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days, and you must not be a prostitute or intimate with any man, and I will behave in the same way towards you. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or household gods. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord, and to his blessings in the last days. And this is the word of God for the people of God. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word. And all God's people together said, thank you. You may be seated. If you had to leave today without anybody knowing, where would you go? You just need some time to yourself. You don't even need to be with family. Is there a friend? Is there a place? Maybe you've suffered a, a, a public embarrassment. Maybe, maybe you've lost your job. Maybe just the pressures of life have gotten so great that you don't know whether to turn to the right or turn to the left. You have a place? Sometimes the best thing that we can do is just turn to God. You see, he knows everything about us anyway. And he desires to help us through those dark struggles of life. And so often we try to go at it alone. Try to make it on our own. Hosea is called one of the minor prophets because, not because his message is, is less important. It's just not as long, which reminds many of us as preachers that a, a sermon doesn't have to be eternal to be immortal. I know the older that I get, sometimes I preach a little bit more. And when my girls come home and they sit in a worship service and we get home or we get to a restaurant and the conversation turns to the service, they don't tell me, Dad, you preached a great message today. I was really blessed by it. No, they usually say, you're preaching longer today than you ever have. And this is how I reply. I believe my time is short. Not as you measure short, but as God measures short. My time is short. 
And so I just have so much that I want to say and so much I want to say to the people. These scriptures in the book of Hosea reveal what Dr. Clovis Chapel called a tragedy in the parsonage. It's a story about a preacher's broken heart and a preacher's broken home. You see, Hosea was preaching and prophesying during a period of prosperity in Israel. It was a time of luxury. It was a time of decadence. Almost everything was going their way. And even though you and I have been living in the last year plus in a global pandemic, things are still going well as it relates to other people's lives around the world as if you don't know that. God is still honored in you, you and me. God is still blessing you and me. But the problem with Israel is the same problem with the United States. Israel, the root of their problem was they had forgotten God. Does that sound familiar today? They had forgotten God. The Hebrew word actually means mislaid or misplaced. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, accused the church of Ephesus of forsaking their first love. They weren't talking about forsaking their first love with an individual. They were talking about forsaking their first love, which is God. You and I have the capability, the capacity to love because he first loved us. That's why John the elder said, Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and those who love are born of God and know God. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. The very nature of God is love. Nobody loves you this morning the same way that God loves you. Your parents don't love you that much. Your grandparents don't love you that much. The world will not love you that much. And when you look at this man named Hosea, if I were to describe him to you today, you would say that is a great man. He was faithful, he was pure, he was a good husband and he was a good father. But he went around doing his prophetic duties with a broken heart because of an unfaithful wife. Now he has three children, and you know how important it was for the Israelites to give their children names that meant something. The firstborn to Hosea and his wife was a son. They named him Jezreel. God said he would punish the house of Jehu in the valley of Jezreel. Not the best name that you would want. But then there was a girl. They named her Lo Ruhamai, which means not loved. Could you imagine naming your child not loved? For you loved that child before he or she ever came into this world. That child was a part of you. And you couldn't wait to hold that child and nurture that child and to grow with that child and then to name that child not loved. There was another child born to this union, another son. And his name was Lo Amahi. None of mine. None of mine. Two children with just horrific names. Not loved and none of mine. And in this dysfunctional family, and let me tell you this, every family is dysfunctional. I don't care how good you got it, you got some dysfunction in your family and in your house. You can be in church every week and you're still dysfunctional and you might say, well, I don't think I'm dysfunctional. Yeah, you are. Because you're a sinner in need of grace. And this is what takes place in the life of Hosea. This unfaithful wife completely leaves her preacher husband and children. Not only does she leave her family, 
she goes into a life of prostitution. And her husband, Hosea, he loves her. He yearns for her. Even though she has been unfaithful, even though she has drug his name through the mud, even though she has made him the laughingstock of everybody around, he wants her back. Do you realize that people of God often commit spiritual adultery before God? That's why James, in his little epistle, called us adulterers and adulteresses. He wasn't talking about the physical act of adultery. But this is what he was saying. We have put earthly things before God. How about you in your life? Really, when you think about your priorities, when you think about all the relationships that exist in your life, where is God? Where is God in your list of priorities? And then you got to ask yourself this. Where is God in the list of my priorities? And then where is his church in the list of my priorities? You need to worry about one relationship. For if you worry about that one relationship and nurture that relationship with the Heavenly Father, every other relationship will fall into place. Now I want you to think about Hosea in his life, in the situation he finds himself in at that time. Hosea hears that his unfaithful wife is going to be sold at the white slave off market. And this is what he does. He goes and buys her back. How about you guys? Would you be willing to do that? She has absolutely wrecked his life. She has made him an object of scorn and ridicule. Can you imagine the jokes about Hosea? But he still loves her. And this is what he wants to do. He wants to redeem her. And God is saying through Hosea to his people, you have been unfaithful. Each and every one of us in here. We put other things before God. And we've been unfaithful. And God looks at us and you know what he says? I still love you. I still long for you. I want to redeem you. I want to bring redemption back into your life. In the book of Isaiah, we are reminded that though our sins may be as scarlet, they can be washed as white as snow. In the book of Galatians, we have an image of Jesus Christ going to the slave market and purchasing you and me. He pays the price through the blood of his own body. That's how much God loves you. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself. He was buying you back and paying the ultimate price for your sins and my sins. Even the Son of Man, as Jesus said, did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, I believe that you and I approach the unpardonable sin when we sin against that type of love. God desires for you to be his child. God desires for you to walk with him. God desires to be the top priority in your life. He says, I want to be number one. Now think in your life right now. Where is God? Where is he in your list of priorities? Is he driving your life? Is he the pilot of your life? You see, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is always seeking those who are lost. He's always asking us, beseeching us, and begging us to come back to him. As a matter of fact, he told three stories to talk about 
the joy that one has when an individual is found. He told a parable about a lost coin that this woman had. And she tore up her house, turned it upside down, sweeping here, sweeping there. She lost it because she was careless. But when she found it, she called all of her friends and all of her family, and they came and rejoiced. He told a story about a sheep that wandered off. Just wandered off. And the shepherd left the 99 and went and found the one. And he rejoiced. He told a story about a lost son who deserted his father deliberately. And you remember the story because we went over it with you last week. He took his father's inheritance, blew it in riotous living. Then when he came to himself, his father received him as a son. Through Scripture, God is always welcoming those and seeking those who've been lost. Mary Magdalene. You know what history tells us about Mary Magdalene? It's not provable through Scripture, but I can see it. Tradition tells us that Mary Magdalene was a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. They were getting ready to stone her. And Jesus said, you without sin, you cast what? The first stone. He was seeking her. Zacchaeus, a tax collector that was hated by everybody, climbs up into a sycamore tree because he wants to put his eyes on Jesus as the caravan is passing by. And Jesus looks up in the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to your house. You remember over lunch? Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. Do you remember the penitent thief on the cross? As he was being executed with God himself. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was merciful to Peter. Following the resurrection as they are walking on the, by the seashore. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Three times he denied Jesus. Three times Jesus wanted to know if he loved him. Could he count on? You see, when we see Jesus seeking those in the depths of sin, we cannot agree with an English theologian who talked about an impassive God. Our God feels our suffering. Our God feels every emotion that we have. Our God desires to share in the joys and the defeats in life. And he says, you can be forgiven. When you're looking for a place to go, when there's no other place to go, you can always come home to God. I love watching documentaries, especially if they're really good with a good twist to it. Let me tell you a story of a documentary on a young man by the name of Casey Terriot. Casey Terriot lived just outside Lansing, Michigan. And he was a high school quarterback who had a lot of offers but decided to go to junior college in the state of California, all the way from Lansing, Michigan to California. He plays his first year and has a great year and starts getting letters and offers from big schools. And he's home on Christmas break and he and some of his high school friends Go to a bar that night. He goes to a bar that night, and there is another man by the name of Jocko who is about 21 years of age. And Jocko has some of his friends with him, and Casey has some of his friends with him. And they start getting into this argument, a testosterone fight, if you will. They're going back and forth, and they go outside the bar, and one thing leads to another. Jocko lunges at Casey. Casey hits him. 
and then decides it's not worth it. And he leaves. He leaves his other four friends, and his other four friends think this is not enough. So they take Jocko, and they kick him and beat him into submission to where he's on a life support machine clinging to life. Now, Casey has no idea what's happened. He's already gone home. Four days later, Jocko dies. And all the boys that were involved are arrested. The judge realizes that there's remorse in Casey's life, but he was a part of it. So whereas his friends got first degree manslaughter, Casey got six months of second degree manslaughter. But there was one person that he had to face, and that was Jocko's mom. Do you know why he had to face Jocko's mom? Jocko's mom wanted to face Casey. And this is what she said. When I sat down with him and I looked at him across the table, I saw Jocko in his eyes. And she said, my faith tells me I have to forgive him. And she did. Six months later, Casey, a white quarterback, gets a lot of interest until they find out he has a past. He has a criminal record. It's a felony. Nobody calls except one coach from Jackson State, Mississippi. And Casey Terriot goes and becomes the SWAC player of the year, the most valuable player, and sets almost every passing record at a predominantly black university because one coach took a chance on him. But here's the caveat. After every game he played he called his parents and he also called Jocko's mom because she wanted to know and she kept all of his stats now do you think that that's easy could you do that somebody could quite possibly be responsible for the death of your child can you forgive them That's God's message through Hosea. Even though you and I sin and cost God his beloved son, he desires to redeem us. We need a passion like that as laymen and preachers today. We need to be willing to love and to cherish one another, to forgive one another in the same manner that we have received forgiveness. But I think it's only going to happen if we have two passions in our life. Two passions or visions, if you will. The first is this. We need need a vision of hell. I'm not going to ask you to hold up your hands, but but I am going to ask you this question. How many of you in here, again, don't hold your hand up. How many of you in here really believe that hell is a physical place of punishment for those who have denied the love of God? All right. I don't think I have a hard time selling that to this group this morning. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, you know what he's had somebody tell him one day? He said, if I really believed what you Christians believe or pretend to believe, I wouldn't rest day or night till I told everybody I know about the love of God. So, if you believe that hell is a real place and people outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ will spend eternity there, here's my question. Why wouldn't you tell others about it? 
And yet 90%, over 90% of the people that fill the church pews on a Sunday morning have never once shared their faith with another person. Never. The book of Acts, the church was so set on fire that they had a compassion, if you will, for lost souls. It was so overwhelming that people accused them of being drunk. It was said of Spurgeon that everybody who sat in his sanctuary had seen a conversion. You see, we need a vision of hell because that friend of yours, that child of yours, that spouse of yours, that neighbor of yours, Hell's going to be filled with good people. Second vision. Jesus can not only forgive sin, but he can change a heart as well. He can change a heart. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat down with people who have dealt with issues of anger, rage, and an unforgiving spirit. An unforgiving spirit. I've had people that have said to me, Preacher, I can't do this. I can't forgive. I know what I'm supposed to do, I just can't do it. And my response is always the same. You don't have to do it. God will do it through you. If you truly submit to Him. Two years ago, I couldn't figure it out, but I'd had a friend of mine that just stopped calling me, and I didn't know if I had done something to him. It was over something that was pretty petty, but yet I would call him. He wouldn't take my phone calls. And I, again, I was having a hard time figuring it out. Till one day I got a call from him, and he asked me if I would meet him for coffee. I met him for coffee, and we talked, and it was the most... It was the most childish thing that I think that I've ever been accused of doing. I, I would tell you sometimes, but I don't have the time. And I'm like, you were upset at me for that? And he said, yes. And he said, but I want you to forgive me, and I need to know that I'm forgiven. I got two choices. I can either say, no, you experience a little bit of what I've been experiencing over the last six months. And I just looked at him, I said, the moment you've asked for forgiveness, it's done. It's done. It is. It was. And it will be. That's not always easy, folks. But you want to know what the hope is for a new world? In a new country? It's new men and women. Changed in the image of God. It's our only hope. It can change you. It can change a community. And it can change a church. Pray with me. Father, we thank you today that we have the opportunity to experience redemption and forgiveness. It is our prayer today, Heavenly Father, that we would understand what you did for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We ask you to just help us to lay aside those things that would hinder us from hearing your voice today. Let us hear you, feel you, and respond to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, Jane is going to sing a hymn of invitation, you just bow your heads where you are, and pray, and there are several decisions you can make today, maybe this morning you need to come and give your heart to Christ, maybe you've never done it, and maybe you're not sure how to do it, we'll help you, maybe this morning you need to come rededicate your life, and you can do that publicly, maybe you need to transfer a church membership, I honestly believe that if you are planted here, you need to grow here, and I, you'll always be on the outside looking in until you become a part. It's a great church because we serve a great God, not because of anything that we're doing. Or maybe this morning you need to come to the altar and just pray.
maybe that's something you, you need to do. Or go to someone else. Ask them to forgive you. Any decision you feel the Lord asking to make you do that. As we sit, as we pray, as we hear the music and respond. Come just as you first five months of this year you are doing exceedingly more than what we did last year and that's a testimony to you what I didn't tell you was this about eight years ago uh, as a church you were